Good morning, everybody. Are we good to go? Are we good to go? Yeah. <laughs> I heard we were having some technical difficulties. So before we get started, I wanted actually to ask uh, everyone to kindly put their cell phones on uh, silent, on mute. Doesn't mean that you can't use it. Uh, we really want you to use your phones to um, expand the conversation on uh, social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. And we will be using uh, today the hashtags, hashtag UN with civil society and hashtag day of families. So please share your thoughts and uh, questions and ideas um, with us through those two hashtags. So good morning again, everyone. My name is Howard Diallo. For those who don't know me, I am the chief of the civil society unit in the Department of Global Communications. Welcome and thank you for joining us here today uh, for today's civil society briefing. I also want to welcome all our viewers online who are watching through uh, the UN uh, uh, webcasts. That's webtv.un.org. So today and all our sessions really are intera interactive discussions. So even if you're not in the room with us, we really want you to um, use uh, the hashtags we've mentioned and welcome you to send any questions or comments that you may have through Twitter. And for this, again, use the hashtags uh, UN with civil society and hashtag day of families. And uh, please also tag us on at UNDGC underscore CSO. So once again, we're really, really proud to be partnering with uh, the Division uh, for Inclusive Social Development at the UN's Department of Economic and Social Affairs for today's briefing. My colleagues, uh, Renata in the room uh, and Armena here, I don't know if this is our third or fourth year. Is it our fourth year, I think? I think so. And I think we're really, really excited to be doing this again. Uh, now, today's briefing, as you know, is entitled Families and Climate Change, focused on SDG 13. And this briefing, as you probably all know, is being held in observance of International Day of Families, which we celebrated yesterday, 15th uh, May. Uh, this year's uh, theme uh, is focused around families, family policies, and the SDG 13 targets. So here at the UN, we believe that families and family-orientated policies are all related programs and are vital for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, particularly uh, goal number 13. As many of you probably know, because you've all schooled the 17 SDGs already by now, right? Anybody not heard about them before? See me in the back room. <laughs> So, as many of you know, SDG uh, Goal 13 targets also include talking about um, improving education and awareness raising, as well as human and institutional capacity on climate action, uh, climate mitigation, adaption, and also impact reduction and early warning. The targets of Goal 13 also um, aim uh, to integrate climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning. Now, what better and common factor could there be than families? Do you agree? Let me get a high five. <laughs> so this is what brings us all here today in the ECOSOC chamber. Today we have a pretty awesome and dynamic panel, and the discussion is going to highlight intergenerational approaches to, to sustainability and the various ways families can be empowered to take climate action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG 13 and all its related targets. Now, I must mention that the central role of cities and communities towards action, uh, climate action is also something that we in this department are talking a lot about. Have you heard about the UN Civil Society Conference? Who has? Raise your hand. If you haven't, two hands. No. <laughs> Want to make sure you guys are awake because I barely had my coffee this morning. So if you don't know, uh, from August 26, 27, 28, the United Nations Department of Global Communications, and we hope all of civil society around the world, is going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah, for the 68th UN Civil Society Conference. We are focusing on uh, SDG 11, 
But you must imagine that family uh, as the anchor and nucleus of cities and communities is definitely going to be touched upon. So we see all the linkages there. So the title of the conference is Building Inclusive and Sustainable Cities and Communities. Uh, I hope that you guys can attend us either in person or perhaps online. So please uh, go to the website. Let's see if I can remember www.un.org slash CSC. 2019 and register and think about uh, coming think about hosting an exhibit or perhaps a workshop if you can't make it there you better have a watch party because I'm watching you <laughs> now um, before I hand over to the um, moderator I really want to give a shout out because I noticed there are a lot of young people in the room uh, the department has a really robust platform for young people especially those young people working uh, in NGOs or even leading NGOs, and we also uh, interact with a lot of university students. So I know that, uh, let's give a shout out to New York Harbor School, because one of our speakers is uh, hailing from there. I also want to mention Farley Dickinson University, a long time uh, NGO associated with the department. Let's hear it for them. And I'm sure I missed a lot of uh, people also. I know it's finals week. So for those of us who are not here from universities, we are with you in spirit. So for the young people, use hashtag DGC Youth to talk to us because we want to hear from you. So it is really my pleasure now to introduce today's moderator, uh, Mr. Ben Freer, Associate Prof Professor from Farley Dickinson University to open today's discussion. I really wish you the best. I'm really excited. I know we're going to really get a lot of productive uh, discussion today. Thank you. Ben. Let's see. I think you're good. Where, are we? Are, there we go. Red is good. Green is bad. All right. Uh, so welcome everyone. It's my honor and privilege to have been asked to serve as the moderator today for this event. International Day of the Family or International Day of Families is a wonderful time for us to come together and talk about how families are a meaningful way to make differences in the world at our local specific level. Uh, I want to welcome all member state representatives, NGOs, academics, Students especially, because these are the people who will be making the decisions that are meaningful for us for the rest of our lives. And uh, I want to just do a brief introduction of myself. I'm an associate professor of psychology uh, at Fairleigh Dickinson University and director of the innovative University Corps program that focuses on preparing the next generation for a prosperous and responsible leadership in the global environment that focuses on developing meaningful and sustainable lives. My research focuses on the exposure to trauma and how that impacts the way we perceive and interact with the world. I've had the fortune of speaking at Haiti in regard to the long-term impacts on the mental health of children and families due to the hurricane uh, back in 2011. And I want to put into the context what we're going to be talking about today. So the International Day of Families provides us an opportunity to promote awareness of issues relating to families and to increase knowledge of social, economic, and demographic processes affecting them. It has inspired a series of awareness-raising events, including National Family Days. In many countries, this day is an opportunity to highlight different areas of interest and importance to families. Today, we're focusing on uh, Sustainable Goal 13, on families and climate action. And I think one of the best representatives of this is Greta Thunberg from Sweden, uh, who has the powerful quote, until you start focusing on what needs to be done rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We can't solve a crisis uh, without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, maybe we should change the system itself. It's my hope that today we can talk about ways that each of us can think about how we can ourselves change the system that we are in to better accommodate and, uh, and fight against climate change in our society. So with enough from me, I want to uh, welcome you to this great event. And we will start today 
with Ms. Vileen uh, Haringer uh, to speak about SDGs and the environment. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be um, here and start the event with a bird view on sustainable development and climate action from a UN perspective um, and uh, at the corporate and the personal level. Um, I don't know if we can see oh, the presentation. I am not seeing it on my screen yet. Is it uh, possible? I don't see it here. <laughs> sorry, but I can't turn every time. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I expected to see the presentation in front of me. Um, so just um, to say that as parents, um, I think it's very natural for us to worry about the world that our children are going to be living in and the impact of our action on their future. I came to environmental management um, from uh, a love of nature, but I think it's when I had my child and seeing him so connected to nature, even in the midst of our concrete uh, jungle that we live in, mm -hmm. that uh, the importance of uh, protecting our, our natural environment really um, sunk in. Um, and I believe that if we could love uh, our planet um, with the same unconditional love that we love our children, um, it would be a much better place. Um, but let's start with uh, a definition. Um, so, yes, that's the correct slide. Um, the UN has a normative role to play. We bring together people around a common um, definition and a common vision. And sustainable development goal is uh, defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own need. And it's really the interconnection between people, five Ps, people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet. We want prosperity and we should prosper, but we shouldn't do it at the detriment of uh, future generation and depleting our resources. Uh, next slide, please. Sustainability is really a global challenge. Um, if we look at uh, some of the world problem, we'll see that the environment is really a common thread. And it might not be obvious initially, but let me give you an example. We can look at gender parity for, um, as one example. It might not be obvious how the environment is impacting that particular challenge. Um, but we find that um, women are disproportionately affected by a degradation of the environment and climate change. They represent 60% of the hungry. And if you think about their role in society, when there is a crisis like a drought, they are the one who will have to walk further and further to find that scarce resources for their family. And it's the same with poverty. Uh, the population that... Um, contribute the least uh, to climate change and to greenhouse gas are the ones that are usually suffering the brunt of uh, climate externalities. So face, uh, next slide please. Uh, faced with uh, such a challenge and the complexity and the magnitude of those challenges, it's very easy to feel powerless. And the sustainable development goal has provided a framework by which that complexity has been broken down in pieces that are somewhat manageable and with measurable target that really focus the action. And the framework has been adopted not only by institutions and governments, but also by the private sector and cities. And everybody is really working toward the same objective, which is very powerful in itself. Um, as we... As we uh, talked about, uh, climate action is goal 13, and it has risen on top of the international agenda. And I would like to invite you to hear from uh, our Secretary General uh, himself on the subject with a very short uh, speech. If we can now uh, show the video on the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. 
embedded in the video? Or yeah, is it a it's control a, click? you can control click and you can. And I thought it was, uh, they have tested it. Um, the Secretary General has been calling for global action on, um, on climate change and um, has um, viewed this challenge as the biggest challenge of our time. Um, it will be good to hear from him after. Uh, but let's continue uh, with a slide on the IPCC report. Um, all the recent reports on climate change have been extremely alarming. And you may have heard of uh, the IPCC report that came out last fall that recommend that we reduce our green, uh, greenhouse gas 50% or close to 50%, 45% by 2030. So that's only 11 years. Um, we don't have time to waste. And if you can, so this is a recommendation. So I would like to... Um, invite us to look at a few sustainable development goals and look at uh, the direct link with the environment. Give some <coughs> example of what the UN is doing in that area and what are some of the actions that you can take at an individual level. So if we go to next slide, please. So goal seven is clean, clean energy. Why it is important is that uh, energy represents 60% of our global greenhouse gas. One of the program of the UN, UNDP, supports government in transforming that energy sector to cleaner energy. But you can also do your part by turning off the lights and your computer, by reducing um, uh, monitor brightness even, and adjusting the thermostat at home, or go for something even more involved in installing solar energy, for example, in your home. And I believe you all know some of those actions, but maybe looking at it as part of the contribution to the sustainable, uh, sustainable development goal will make them more compelling. Sustainable or responsible consumption, goal 12, is extremely important. Um, if we continue to consume in the way we are doing now, we would need about three planets um, in order to sustain our current lifestyle. So what can we do? I mean, we can be responsible consumers. And UN Environment has initiatives that, that provide information on uh, the sustainability of product and services. And you can use some of those resources as well as other eco-label that, um, that are available to guide you in your purchasing um, for your family and um, for your community and beyond. So buying from sustainable companies is something you can do, reducing the purchase of disposable items, things that are going to be used once and discarded. Look for opportunity to reuse and repurpose as much as possible. Looking at the next uh, goal, um, climate action. So climate action is also very related to a very a commodity that you need in your family, which is food. Um, estimates show that uh, with an increase in temperature, we are also decreasing the yield of very common crops like wheat, corn, our staple that we are relying on. Uh, so again, we have programs that work with farmers to adapt to climate change and increase yield. And what you can do is try to decrease your carbon footprint. Uh, you can green your commute, eat more meat-free, uh, meals. Um, we are not asking everybody to be vegetarian, but uh, anything can help. And uh, you can also offset your remaining carbon emission. Uh, the UNFCCC has uh, created a very easy platform similar to Amazon. You can go, click, find a project you like, and you can contribute to a project that will actually reduce greenhouse gas emission somewhere in the world and uh, usually in a, in a country where the most uh, need uh, is. Looking at uh, life underwater, so I'm sure you're very aware that uh, marine pollution is an enormous problem and is also has been uh, rising on top of the international agenda. 
Um, and this is one where we can really contribute as individual and as family. Drinking from reusable bottles, so I brought mine. <laughs> um, reducing the amount of plastic that we buy and uh, also being sure that we are disposing of um, and recycling properly. And I wanted to, I hope that this can work. Uh, UN Environment has launched uh, some awareness campaign and uh, there is a particular, a small video that is really, um, I think, very compelling, uh, calling Break Up With Plastic. Are we able to show the video? Have you tried to do control click and see if that would work? That would be a shame. Oh, yeah. yes. that's promising. Let's give it a minute, and if not, we'll just continue. Oh, this is bad. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's working. Oh, I think you're supposed to have to say. Oh, my God. Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> get a, a few. OK, so I will uh, continue. Uh, one of the last goals I wanted to touch upon was uh, life on land, and drought and desertification is taking away land that we could use for uh, food, uh, food production. Um, and we have programs that are looking at um, deforestation and uh, reducing um, carbon emission from, uh, from this degradation. You can support those forestation efforts. You can go paperless. You can look for labels that uh, ensure that what you are buying is from uh, uh, sustainable uh, forest. Um, I don't have much time, but I just wanted to touch upon some of the work that is being done also internally to improve the environmental, man the environmental performance of our operation at the UN. Um, the UN, uh, next slide. if you could have the next slide, sorry. Um, the UN has adopted the climate neutrality strategy, which aims at being climate neutral by 2020, which is right around the corner. Um, and this is done through measurement, reducing and offsetting any unavoidable emission. When we look at the retrospective uh, of the past 10 years, we can see that a significant efforts has been made um, throughout the UN system. And one of the tools, next slide please, one of the tools that we have adopted is uh, a systematic approach to environmental management. So, uh, using um, international standards like ISO 14001, which prescribe that we should integrate environmental consideration into all of our business processes and business system. And it should be a continuous loop of improvement. And just to make it a little bit more concrete, next slide please. Uh, at UNHQ, we have assessed our environmental impact and uh, we did a lot in terms of energy, water use, paper use, uh, reduction in the range of 60 to 80 percent uh, as well buying renewable energy but we identify waste management as one of our priority and by using a systemic approach next slide please um, we can tackle we were able to have a very significant result in a couple of years um, touching upon all the different aspects of uh, and of uh, waste management plastic reduction um, sorting of waste, recentralized waste station being introduced, looking at opportunity to reuse, and also managing the end disposal of our waste. So we don't have any waste going to landfill. We are trying to maximize recycling, composting, and the rest is actually converted into energy. And this is, as I said, it's a continuous effort. We, uh, we don't stop at one end. It's, it's a reiterative process. So I'm very happy that uh, in June we are looking at eliminating uh, most source of single-use plastic, um, in, in especially from our cafeteria operation. And I will close by inviting you to view the world through a green lens. You can take that environmental perspective in your personal life, in your family, in your communities, in your workplace. And it's not about being dogmatic. It's about looking for opportunities for change, progressive change, in your area of influence and action. And there are a lot of resources. I've just listed three from the UN, UN Environment, where you can find that video that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't show you. Greening the Blue, that is more focused on action at the corporate level and behavioral change. And the Act Now campaign in the context of the Climate Action Summit the uh, Secretary General is convening this September, and my colleague uh, will tell you a lot about that uh, later in the program. 
Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, I want to point out I failed to do a proper introduction. Uh, Ms. Herringer is the Environmental Sustainability Manager at the Department of Management Strategy, Policy, and Compliance of the UN Secretariat here in New York. She coordinates the development of a UN Secretariat-wide policy framework for environmental sustainability management and previously managed UN headquarters greening activities in the Office of Central Support Services. So brings in uh, amazing uh, expertise in history of how to impact uh, at the secretariat level uh, on the environment and climate change. So thank you for those great comments. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Matthew Kaplan. Uh, who will be speaking about intergenerational programs in aging. He's a faculty member at Penn State University and conducts research uh, and develops curricular resources that provide leadership in the development and evaluation of intergenerational programs. We look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Kaplan. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Freyer. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Diallo, uh, Mrs. Kakmarska, all my uh, esteemed uh, co-fellow uh, presenters. So um, let me dive right into it. Next slide, please. One more. All right, so um, what I'm going to really uh, focus on is, uh, is intergenerational perspectives and practices and how that could be relevant to our task at hand, which is to focus on climate awareness and climate action. Um, and uh, my beginning point is uh, what I see as a major difficulty with uh, think, getting people to think and act globally is the, uh, the fact that these issues seem so abstract and beyond people's experience. So it's very hard to get people to, to dive in, to know what to do, and to care. So how do you get them to care about climate change or care about the loss of nature or uh, join efforts to restore natural ecosystems, um, and nevertheless to, to take to some of these other actions. All right, next slide, please. So um, if you happen to live next to an environmental disaster that's related to some of the uh, factors related to climate change, it's not so hard to, it's not abstract. You're experiencing it and it's right there. There's a photo. Uh, from Taiwan, hotels falling into the water due to uh, flooding of a nearby river. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what about those who are not living next to a disaster? How do we make this uh, more relevant uh, to their experience and uh, get, them, get people to entertain the fact that they could be um, ecological citizens? So um, I have a clue that came to mind from a memory of mine when I was 10 years old. I was watching, um, I was watching an old show uh, called The Bowery Boys. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen The Bowery Boys. I don't know. Uh, raise your hand if you know The Bowery Boys. <laughs> At any rate, I was very young, and uh, it was in black and white TV, as most of our TVs were. I grew up in the Lower East Side, so I was very interested. They were very cool kids. They were like tough, they were funny. And one thing really caught my mind, there was this one, caught my eye, this one episode, they were swimming in the East River. <laughs> Next slide, please. Swimming in the East River, the way I learned in school was that's, uh, that's sort of a death sentence. There were all these bacteria, toxins, and they would say, you could definitely get sick, it's impossible. But then I kind of looked this up, and indeed, people were swimming in the East River about one or two blocks from where I was raised. So what was beyond my comprehension, I just kind of uh, repressed the memory. But now, next slide, please. Uh, now in reflecting on this from an intergenerational point of view, I have some what ifs. Like what if I was able to meet some older adults who actually swam in the East River? What if I got a chance to ask them, wow, did you get sick? I wouldn't ask them if they died, because obviously they'd be there. <laughs> did you know anybody that died? Um, and what happened to make this so polluted that I can't swim in it with my friends, like the Bowery Boys did? 
And also, what if I had access to some uh, mentor, some environmental activist who knew about the environmental studies material I was learning in school, but can help make me make the connection between that and the river and, and help me find some pathways to further learning and intervention? Next slide. So my point here, or the point here, is that um, environmental awareness and ecological citizenship can be fostered through intergen and should be fostered regularly through our relationships across generations in families and through connections with older adults and people across the age continuum in the community. So if I had a mentor at that time, I probably would have been more aware of these issues at a far earlier stage. Next slide. All right, so where do the sparks come from to help ignite climate awareness and climate action? So we see it from many directions. Um, we see it from uh, youth-oriented civic engagement and activism. Certainly, uh, by now, I believe most of us or all of us have heard about the wondrous uh, Greta Thunberg, a uh, Swedish uh, schoolgirl at age 15 sat outside the Swedish government building for two weeks in protest. At any rate, really uh, sparked the movement. So internationally, around the world, you have youth uh, not only connected with her inspiration, but many other inspiring uh, initiatives and, and, uh, and sparks uh, to actually protest the state of affairs. And then we have some older adult volunteerism initiatives. Uh, people who call themselves uh, things like environmental stewards and echo elders, and late blooming climate activists. And then sometimes you have uh, family uh, strength type organizations. Uh, like Dr. Freyers, um, who basically are realizing that the environment really is something that brings families together um, in terms of uh, how they can experience nature and improve it. Okay, uh, next slide. So um, when we talk about intergenerational approaches to environmental education, um, all these are intergenerational to some degree, but some focus more on one generation at a time. So uh, if it's youth-inspired or older adult-inspired, and then eventually they're interacting with other generations, that's important work. But the way I'm looking at it, I like when it kind of moves towards the center, where we're looking at um, a way of framing the intergenerational dimension as co-learning and co-action, where we understand the roles, the importance of agency for all generations in initiatives that are beginning. So that's the perspective I'm taking here. Uh, next slide. And, and uh, when you look at uh, intergenerational initiatives focused uh, at ecosystem restoration and other uh, environmental ed type programs, some of the benefits are of intergenerational groups. You have the living experience of individuals in the group who can help you see how environments have changed over time. Also, they have different, uh, different cohorts, have different experiences in terms of knowledge. Um, in terms of insights, uh, these issues transcend age. And therefore, we really want to understand how they transcend uh, our timeline of experience in our environments. Okay, so it's really about empowering all generations, not just one or two or one at a time. And in terms of action and influencing politics and policies, I think you want to have as many allies as you could for uh, promoting agenda change. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of uh, these kinds of approaches, I think there are three categories we're talking about, just to simplify things. Uh, there are some great intergenerational, family-oriented environmental education initiatives around the world. I started collecting them. I was going to list them, but there are thousands, <laughs> apparently, which is so exciting. We're, we're sitting in the, at the footfront, uh, at the footstep of, a, of an international movement. So um, we have all these initiatives pro promoting awareness, conducting research. Uh, and taking action together. So I'll move through the next few slides quickly. Um, so, oh, back to the last one, sorry. Not that quickly. <laughs> That's good, okay. So in terms of research, uh, here are just some categories and, uh, of research type projects. I've seen some projects where, uh, which are pretty much like this, same goals, but they're done mono-generationally. You could have one large water body, a senior volunteer, environmental uh, assessment club, taking water quality management, and then you have a youth uh, group, students, 
after school program, 4-H or whatever, also on the other side of the water body taking, this, taking water quality management. It's, it baffles me why not uh, do this in an age integrated fashion. You'll get more data and you'll have more um, stimuli for uh, learning about different ways to measure things, different ways to act upon your findings. It becomes a lot more rich. All right, next slide. Uh, taking action, there are, <laughs> this is uh, from the Habitat Intergenerational Program, uh, which is a, an environmental center and wildlife sanctuary in, in Massachusetts. So uh, families, get, families happen to come, they love this place, and they're making it their business to, um, to improve and plant uh, trees and so on, native uh, species. <laughs> so um, my, my view on how do we stimulate action is that we don't ask people to take action. I, well, obviously, I don't wanna say what we don't do. I'm just saying it's very difficult to start with asking people to take global action. So my, my point is it's really helpful to, to step it up, to create stepping stones of action. First, we begin with uh, helping people understand how the environment affects themselves, their health, their bodies. Next slide. So at Penn State University, uh, with Extension, we've done uh, many family-based intergenerational uh, nutrition education type programs and we've even done some, we have a program called Fridge to help people's families talk about food and uh, work as teams to eat more healthfully. We did one of these 16-hour uh, programs over a weekend on a farm which added the, uh, the health to family to environment connection. So one student who went through that, her quote was, we saw food growing. So to understand self in the context of environment is the beginning, next slide. Uh, and then we have uh, groups like family nature clubs, people like Chiara de Amor who, um, who developed this model. Phenomenal, so families are connected, uh, they connect with themselves, they bond through experience in nearby nature. Sometimes they're, they're just enjoying, sometimes they're uh, doing, taking projects. Uh, in this, this image, they're creating a native tree grove uh, in a forest fragment, uh, fragment, fragmented with native uh, invasive plants. So it's strengthening family relationships. Next slide. So families, um, there's a lot of research showing that there is a relationship between family time in nature and a sense of connection that not only youth have, but all generations have to nature as well as to possibilities for environmental action. And uh, certainly we have a lot of uh, evidence as well that spending time in nature, especially with an, with an adult who models that comfort with and enjoyment of nature, uh, helps the young, young people develop a positive and protective relationship with the environment. All right, next slide. We're gonna, uh, this is just a couple of uh, community uh, uh, activities. This is also in Taiwan, my colleague Nikki Liu um, in Taipei University. Uh, there's a senior group called the 100 Year Old Trees Group. They, uh, they, they care for these old trees, but they also know the mythology and stories of them. They pass on the culture, local culture, family culture, uh, to young people by telling them about these trees, the physical part of the trees, how do we take care of them, and the stories associated with them. So young people are, wow, this is important. Next slide. And then universities are doing cool things. Here's uh, universities are part of communities too, right? Grandparents University at University of Wisconsin, uh, they don't just want older adult alumni coming for four day uh, uh, experience of learning what the university's up to. They want to bring their grandkids. Very successful. They learn about the environment together, learn about the university. Next. Penn State, we have our Ag Progress Days. Uh, we tried uh, creating like an intergenerational environmental learning hub, a little unit, uh, where people would sit down as they pass by and we'd have questions for them to ask each other about the environment as it was, as it is, and how you want it to be in the future. Next slide. Uh, University of British Columbia, they have a, an intergenerational farm. Uh, <laughs> so they have mentors, they have farmers. Okay, thank you, doing fine. Um, and uh, the students learn about sustainable growing practices, nutritious food preparation, and many other things. And the elders are sharing their expertise, farming histories and experiences. It's really win-win. Next slide. 
So basically, what I'm advocating here is that we want to, uh, we want to think about age-integrated uh, planning for implementing climate awareness and action initiatives. So they learn, people learn to the, together, and they could solve problems together. And that's a loop. You learn, you take action, and what you learn from action, you go back to learning. We can't do it alone. Um, next slide. Okay, it's my contact information. Can we go back to the last one? We can't do it alone, and uh, in my closing statement, I'm just going to mention the title of an article that a couple of my colleagues uh, wrote. Uh, it's called The Environment, The Quintessential Intergenerational Challenge. And this was written over 20 years ago. Notice how they wrote intergenerational challenge, not a multi, not a monogenerational or multi-generational. Multi-generational would mean like you could do your water monitoring over there, we'll do our monitoring over there. But intergenerational is that we're doing this together. We're learning together and taking action together. So thank you for the opportunity to share uh, some of our work and colleagues' work. Great. Thank you so much for your comments, Matt. This is uh, very interesting work. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to our next speaker, Steve Chu representing the Buddhist Zhu Chi Foundation's main representative of the United Nations. Uh, his work focuses on disaster relief, climate action, and education for global citizenship, sustainable development, and gender equality, working to build relationships and share best practices. So we look forward to those. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for having me. And happy International Day of Families to everyone present here today. Um, my name is Steve Chu. I am a uh, representative of Tsuchi Foundation and also a member of the UN Department for Global Communications Youth Representative Steering Committee. Uh, and I'm super grateful to be here with everyone on this panel. And just, it's an absolute treat hearing everything so far. And I'm so excited to hear my other fellow panelists as well. Uh, next slide, please. And one more following that. So um, I'm going to quickly paint a portrait of what these ideas and practices look like from an NGO perspective, along with giving uh, everyone a couple of different uh, ideas and models in terms of how we can take these uh, philosophies of really empowering families to take climate action to that next step. So it, real quick, Tsuji in Chinese translates to compassion and relief. And we were really founded on this idea that we want to empower everyone regardless of their age, um, rich or poor, or socioeconomic status, to really be able to take action to alleviate the the suffering of others. And so we work in multiple dimensions of charity, medicine, education, and humanistic culture, really to try to deliver this comprehensive approach to helping someone who is in need, whether they are across the ocean from us or right next door to us, and recognizing that we all have that innate capacity to take those actions. Next slide. Um, so we were founded in 1966. We now work in 98 countries with about 10 million volunteers. So in the 53 years we've been doing this work, uh, we've really tried to empower those who are uh, vulnerable to help those around them uh, as well. And so this is kind of the frame that we exist in. Uh, next slide, please. So in the past uh, some years, since 1991, we've been reaching out beyond our uh, own spaces and our own communities to really engage in disaster relief. Um, and in doing this disaster relief work, we really saw the um, impacts that climate change can have on the fragile lives that we all have and how it can easily disrupt someone from a perfectly normal life and shatter everything into uh, a sense of hopelessness. And so since then, we've really been working on uh, climate action and environmental protection to try to uh, stimmy the growth of climate change and prevent the extremities of disasters from getting even worse and impacting uh, even more people. Uh, next slide. So uh, recognizing that climate change and climate action uh, within the Sustainable Development Goals, as Violaine had so beautifully put it, a lot of uh, the methods are very intergovernmental. And so while we have to hold our governments responsible for the actions they are taking um, and what they've promised to us in Paris, 
and recognizing that from what the IPCC has recommended, we need to do even more, ramp up even more urgent climate action. There's still a lot to be done on an individual level, and we can't just stall and wait for the governments to solve all of those problems for us, right? Because at the end of the day, governments are made up of individuals which are made up uh, which make up families. And so if we can target the empowerment of families and individuals, we might be able to add additional um, pressure onto our governments to really see that the tides are shifting beyond what is already present. And so I want to raise uh, this beautiful idea that the Sustainable Development Goals in their creation are truly deeply interlinked. Um, SDG 12 and 13 really go hand in hand, and I want to paint a portrait of that for you. Uh, next slide. So uh, the climate emergency that we face right now really requires an additional lens, a shift of mindset. Um, and so uh, Violaine had mentioned the green lens, and I want to add an additional lens we can put on our eyeballs, which is the global citizenship uh, lens. And so uh, if we want to define a global citizen, we could say in this context for what I'm speaking today, it's an individual who recognizes that they're a part of a global community and takes action at, on not only a local level, but moves all the way up to a global level, kind of through the steps and practices that Matt was just explaining to you earlier. And while recognizing we're part of this global community, it isn't to say that we're homogenized. We all have our own diverse cultures, our heritages, our nationalities, and those are all precious and we should cherish them, but also recognize that we are all part of the same planet. We all share the same fate. And that shared prosperity is something we should collectively work towards. And so while we work for people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership, we should ensure that we aren't uh, doing so at the expense of the most vulnerable. Uh, so next slide. So at the end of the day, uh, we're really here to talk about not only the international solutions that can be present, but the grassroots uh, solutions that we as individuals can take. Because um, ultimately, climate change will touch all of our lives, whether it's right now looking at the um, water scarcity issues that are forcing climate refugees to leave their homes, or looking at future uh, moments where the rising tides get so bad uh, that the small island developing states have to uh, forcibly evacuate their countries and their own homelands, never to see them again. These are things that will come for us. And so knowing that climate change will touch all of our lives, uh, what can we do to not only look outwards to hold our leaders accountable, but look inwards to see how we are part of this problem, but also part of the solution? Next slide. Okay, so uh, the two uh, different solutions I wanna talk about right now are related to plastic consumption and uh, sustainable living. And so we, we all know that uh, plastic plays a huge problem. We, we hear a lot about single-use plastics. Um, the Center for Environmental uh, or International Environmental Law just put out this beautiful report um, linking the uh, role that plastic has to uh, do with fossil fuel consumption. And they uh, put forth that over just this one year in 2019, we're going to have about 850 million ton metric tons of greenhouse gases produced just from the production and incineration of uh, new virgin plastics. Um, and that's not even to consider the uh, greenhouse gases that are emitted once plastics uh, make it into the ocean. Um, and so as part of what Saji is looking to do, we want to make it experiential, kind of like what Matt was saying. And so we put forth uh, recycling centers and we build these centers to be a place that people from all generations can come together and as family units and learn about the impacts plastics have on the environment and then also what they can do to not only recycle, but thinking about uh, refusing plastics and then also rethinking our relationships with plastics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so one model that we do in addition to uh, recycling is looking at transformation. And so we turn these plastics that we recycle and clean in our recycling centers into textiles that we use for humanitarian assistance. And there's definitely not enough time to talk about all these things, but looking for innovative solutions, that's something that not only comes from the youth level, but from the uh, older person's level as, as well, knowing that we can draw on these experiences. And so how can we, through our family dynamics, through our community dynamics, facilitate more of those uh, conversations? Next slide. Um, and then so maybe in the brief moments that I have left, finally I'll talk about sustainable living and really this idea that we, we see a lot of uh, news on climate change and 
this notion that there's a lot of climate despair within our own individual communities. And you can really get trapped in your heads on this idea that not, uh, there, there's this overwhelming sense of despair, but it's in taking action concretely within our own lives that we can re begin to regain that sense of hope and that optimism that then seeps into our own bodies, that then influences your parents, your siblings, uh, and your family, which then influences your community, and hopefully by changing our own hearts, we'll be able to change the world. Uh, next slide. Um, or actually go a couple more forward to the last slide. I wanna include uh, this last slide on resources. I don't have enough time to really go through the entire presentation, it seems, um, and I'm more than happy to talk more after the panel or during Q&A. Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. Next slide. One more, yes, beautiful. Okay, so if you want to, oh, uh, one, more one, one more back. If you want to get more involved uh, in anything related to uh, climate action, particularly with families who uh, have parents who don't necessarily uh, have access to that information and want a great place to start, these are some fantastic places to begin, um, whether that's some of the material that our organization has put out or some of these great links that uh, go towards resources and information. Um, and I'll just close by saying that, um, final slide over. We have a quote that I really live and breathe by, and it's this notion that everything, whether it's from protecting the earth to doing good for humankind, really begins with ourselves and in turn begins with our families. So looking at how we can foster more understanding and dialogue within the family unit will really bring forth greater understanding for what we can do collectively. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, never one of the fun parts of being the moderator is speeding up our speakers, so I apologize for that. Uh, but what a great way to finish uh, your comments with that beautiful quote. Uh, it's my honor to now uh, introduce our next speaker, Tolu Alobami, uh, an entrepreneur and global advocate for migrants and refugees and displaced people. Born in Nigeria and raised here in the United States, she spent her career inspiring young people to action and giving voice and value to the voiceless. So we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Good morning. Well, almost afternoon, but six, eight minutes to go. How's everyone doing? All right, you're going to have to come here with me. I, I need some energy. So please, I need some excitement. How is everyone doing? Thank you, so much better, I love it. Um, well, I am so excited to be here to speak with you. That's why I need you to match my energy because at the United Nations, we are launching this incredible new campaign that I am so, so thrilled to tell you about. So 2019 for us here at the UN is a very vitally important year when it comes to climate. Uh, we, as the world, 2020 is really a benchmark for us, a deadline for us to, to turn things around and so 2019 sets us up to be able to do that. This year, all UN systems, funds, and programs, and those with our NGO partners, our youth advocates, we are all very much focused on making sure that we confront the climate challenge in every single way that we can. Wherever our power lies, we plan to do that. With that, the Secretary General is uh, planning a climate summit this September, on September 23rd. And this climate summit is going to bring leaders together, not just to talk and decide and think and Rue, um, but really to make commitments towards acceleration of the Paris Agreement. Now, in the lead up to that, the Secretary General found it very important to have you and I, and every single one of us who is not necessarily a, heads of, a head of state, but has the power to confront the climate challenge to get involved. Your voice matters, your actions matter, and our campaign that we're launching is an opportunity for you to use your voice and your actions in support of the United Nations and support of, of our planet. We all know that climate activism is growing. Several of my fellow panelists have shared examples of activism on, on climate around the world, from the school strikes to the trash bag challenge, et cetera. You know, a lot of people are very focused on climate right now. At the same time, there are folks that are not engaged on climate. So you have those that are climate heroes by every, um, every, um, every measure that you can use. Um, they are climate heroes. And then there are those that don't understand 
what the relationship is between climate and the fact that up until what yesterday it was 40 degrees in New York in May mm -hmm. uh, you know so it's like there's climate there's weather there's all these things that are interconnected how does that how does that all work and how am I involved in that how can I support that well to that our campaign not only raises awareness but also allows you to take action. ACT NOW is the United Nations global call to individual action on climate change. It is a critical part of uh, the UN's coordinated effort to raise awareness, ambition, and action for climate change and to accelerate implementation of the Paris Agreement. As I mentioned, we've seen everywhere, uh, we see people taking every opportunity to step up for climate, whether with their voice, their vote, uh, and in many cases, their actions. With Act Now, a primarily online and social media campaign, we plan to educate and encourage individuals mainly by adjusting consumption patterns to confront the climate challenge. So what do I mean by that? Well, the decisions we make every single day affect our planet. Every choice we make affect our planet. From the food we eat to the clothes we wear, all of those things have an impact on, on, on climate. So we are asking you, knowing that all of those things have an impact on climate, to make the best possible choice of actions that have as little impact, negative impact on the planet as possible. We are going to be using AI technology to spur behavior change when it comes to climate action. So we've developed, uh, and this is for us at the UN, very, very cool. We're so, so excited because we're not always at the cutting edge of innovation um, and technology, but in this, we are, we are thrilled. So we have developed an AI bot uh, that will encourage you to make, those, uh, to, to make those changes in your habits and your consumption patterns. Within this AI bot that is currently being piloted on Facebook Messenger, you will have 10 actions that each and every one of us can take every single day to confront the climate challenge. So it would recommend things like a five-minute shower, um, recommend uh, you know, the five-minute shower or buying local and seasonal produce, uh, you know, um, recycling your water bottle, uh, et cetera. And with that, you not only get these recommendations and get insights of what these actions will have on the climate, it will give you information on that. You'll go, you'll, it will ask you for information, you'll share information, it will help, it will recommend actions to take. But more than that, it gives you the opportunity to log those actions that you are taking. And why that is so important is because the more people act, the greater the impact. And with this AI bot uh, that we've developed, you will be able to log your climate actions along with those of people around the world and be able to show, come September at the Climate Summit, the world, how many of our global citizens are already eager and engaged on climate. Now, I know that we are unable to show the video demonstrating the bot, but you can currently see the piloted version of Facebook Messenger. If you just go to actnow.bot, um, you can see the piloted version on Facebook Messenger, um, and that will immediately start allowing you to log your actions. We are planning a lot of exciting gamification and ways for you to really connect with the UN on, on the campaign, um, but you can take a look at that now. Right now, there are about 120 actions that have already been logged, so please make sure yours is one of them. In addition to the Act Now bot, we also have too many campaigns that focus on two industries that touch all of our lives every single day, food and fashion. The fashion industry is a $25 trillion industry and considered a top user of the natural resources and polluter in the communities where it operates. When it comes to food, what we put on our plate affects the planet. Since we all eat and since we all wear clothes, hopefully, um, this is an opportunity for you to confront the climate challenge by what you choose to put on your plate, by what you choose to wear, and how you choose to do it. I am fast running out of time. I am happy to talk to all of you um, after this panel. There's so much more that I'd love to share about this exciting campaign, but it is pulling together corporations, the entire U.S and system, um, institutions, young people, old people, me, old people, you know, everyone, uh, because there's something that we can all do, and this is an opportunity for you to join hand in hand with the work of the Secretary General directly. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tolu. Uh, so our final speaker, I'm very excited to introduce uh, as a high school junior here in New York City. She studies marine policy and environmental advocacy at New York Harbor School on Governor's Island, a very new school that is trying to actively uh, act against climate change and introduce uh, and teach the young people how we can engage with the climate in a more effective way. And as we'll see, the youth is really the ones that will be teaching us how is the best way to interact with our environment. So Paula, thank you so much. It is an honor to be speaking here today on behalf of not only New York Harbor School, but on behalf of my fellow youth and future generations. I would like to give a sincere thanks to Renor Janey, the youth coordinator who has brought all of us here today, as well as the UN Foundation, all to discuss the importance of international climate change and intergenerational sustainability. This is an incredibly important time for the civil society briefing to be held. However, uniform progress on the implementation of the 17 SDGs has not met the expectations and may not reach the lofty 2030 time limit. More so than ever, we face the ever-looming certainty that life as we know it on Earth will cease to exist in a few decades if nothing substantial is done to prevent climate change, poor waste management, and other damages. Planet Earth will inevitably face irreversible damage such as being pulled closer to the sun. Yet this inevitable outer space event won't have the chance to happen if humanity destroys the Earth before the sun can get to it. There's a natural order of things after all and humanity is directly getting in the way of said order. Instead, we should turn our focus to the present and aid each other in attempting to prevent further environmental destruction on Earth. I want to remind those here today that there are attainable solutions to the challenges that currently face humanity. We should not simply cower and avoid dealing with the problems that we have caused throughout human history, but muster our determination and intergenerational cooperation to solve these problems in this current generation before future generations have to fix the compounding problem that was not their fault to begin with. Past generations have done enough of passing the baton of responsibility to upcoming generations. Although we have been giving the broken up baton, there is still hope. Climate change, as I am sure we are all aware, is very intertwined with every single SDG, not just SDGs 6, 13, 14, and 15. As HE Ambassador Inga Rhonda King said in her remarks on the climate and SDGs linkage held on March 11th of this year, none of the SDGs can be realized if we let climate change endanger our planet and future generations. Vice versa, realizing the SDGs will contribute to halting climate change. Families, too, play a large role in climate change, though not in the way that one may think. Families have a big part in this fight against climate change as what we teach our children regarding things like recycling, composting, and sustainability are what they will likely take into adulthood and pass on to their children. I am proud to say my parents are immigrants from Mexico. They experience a less ideal upbringing, being raised in impoverished conditions, conditions such as not knowing when their next meal, if any, would be. Sustaining for not only themselves, but siblings at a young age. Their parents never took the time to educate them on the importance of climate change on the environment. As a matter of fact, compost and recycling were foreign concepts to my grandparents and parents prior to coming to America. For this reason, I wasn't made aware of how my everyday actions would affect the environment until I began attending public school. Education is and has always been the mark of societally cultured and intelligent cooperation of people towards a civil society. In this day and age, especially in developed nations, a college degree is a necessity to achieve many things in life. Even as high schoolers, myself and many of my peers are required to have certain grades and skills learned in school to get internships and summer jobs. There have been many efforts to implement long-term education improvement solutions in terms of math, science, and reading. To provide an example, SCG4 is tackling the issue of inclusive and quality education for adolescents around the world. However, as a New York Harbor School student, I believe that educating youth and communities on not just those subjects, but also on sustainability and environment is an important facet of education that should be recognized. 
Moreover, even families trying to be sustainable and impart good environmental lessons to their children struggle with a high cost to do so. Trying to be sustainable in this day and age is an expensive and sacrificial path that people will walk. Packageless grocery stores, fair trade clothes, and organic, sustainably grown food is a big drain on personal finances, especially when you have other people under your care to think about. Families who try to manage their food spending often have to resort to extreme couponing, an industry that mainly offers coupons for cheap, not organic, and not fair trade food. The intergenerational sustainability goal of this briefing is an unobtainable goal for most lower class families, unless significant government and pro government aid programs are given a higher budget, improved and expanded. I truly believe that achieving the amazing goal of sustainable family farming practices in third world countries is not only doable, but crucial. Living in New York City, we purchase our food and produce from big supermarkets or overly expensive farmers markets. This creates a wide gap between us and our food. We don't get to see how the food is grown or what kind of feed they're feeding the farm animals. Are these are these eggs really cage free? Are my potatoes being sprayed with mass amounts of dangerous chemicals to ward off bugs? These are questions that people have to ask themselves when they are, as a consumer removed from the raising and growing of their food. I'm positive we would all love to believe the commercial ads that attempt to make us believe potatoes have a magical way of fixing all of our problems, but the ugly reality is hidden away from the general uninformed consumer. By neglecting to question how our food is produced, we begin to blindly accept the current utilized methods to obtain our food. Yet, in third world countries, they have not necessarily industrialized yet. The relative lack of infrastructure and high demand of goods in these places means that they can live in simpler and less economic driven lives. This can extend to food production and oftentimes some people living in less developed countries can't just hop on the I-95 and hit up a local Walmart for their produce. From an indigenous perspective, this is a great thing, as it means that people can grow and be responsible for their own food. They realize where it's being grown, who's growing it, and can share the fruits of labor with neighbors, thus creating a system of self-dependency and organic sustainability. Developed countries are assets in stepping in to broaden and improve the system. From observation, I have noticed that many New, York New Yorkers are interested in sustainable farming practices. Governor's Island has experienced families flocking to the Grow NYC Teaching Garden. With the growing popularity of outdoor farmer markets and an increased public interest in sustainable and fair trade food practices, it's evident that many people, regardless of class status, are open and interested in these sorts of ideas, whether it be for the sake of their health, the environment, or the lives and rights of foreign workers. SDGs 2, 12, 14, and 15 are related to these ideas. And judging by the recent progress of the Equator Initiative, the Green Commodities Program, and the UNDP UNEP Poverty Environment Initiative, these issues and one similar to it are already being tackled in governments around the world. To sum this all up, families play a major role in the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the combating of climate change and intergenerational sustainability. I'd like to acknowledge and give thanks to my mother, Antonia Rodriguez, for coming here to support me, New York Harbor School's principal, Jeff, for allowing me to represent not only my marine policy and environmental advocacy, CTE, but my fellow youth in this environment. Furthermore, I would like to thank Rob Markuski for helping me throughout my years at Harbor School to gain a passion and appreciation for the conservation and protection of the environment. I would also love to personally shout out Athena Murray, a current junior enrolled in the same CTE as I, and who also happens to be my great friend. She played a huge role in helping me write these remarks and I can't thank her enough for that. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Excellent remarks, Paula. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we've certainly learned that the New York Arbor School deserves all of our support and commitment uh, so that we can meet their lofty goals of what they're trying to do with their students. So thank you so much. Uh, we now believe that we've uh, solved a little bit of tech uh, and that we can now see the Act Now uh, video. So, um, let's see. Do you want to introduce it for us maybe yeah, again? So this is, sorry, let's see. All right. 
I think you can hear me now. Um, so we're just going to show a quick demo of what the bot looks like, how it works, et cetera. Um, it's going to look a little different um, when you when we relaunch it at the end of May. But I can talk you through I can talk you through it now. So. Or I could just talk. <laughs> that works too. So <laughs> we might almost be there. So while they're doing that, I can use this time to tell you more about the timeline for the campaign. I might be cheating a little, but that's okay. Um, so we'll launch the optimized bot at the end of May, and then our, our two challenges on food and fashion. The, the food challenge will be launched on June 18th, uh, gastronomy, Sustainable Gastronomy Day, and then our fashion challenge will be launched in early August. Both will be spearheaded, uh, the food by leading chefs that will share their, sustainably, uh, their sustainable food creations and then throw it to you all around the world to share your own creations. We will have videos and photos, et cetera, and we'll actually be featuring some of the contributions you share on UN channels as well. And the fashion will be the same. The fashion challenge will be spearheaded by lead, uh, lead fashion designers, not just here in the West, but also in the global South, um, that will show their uh, upcycled creations, so taking old looks, turn it into new, whether it's shopping at a thrift store or taking something you already have in your closet and using it um, in, uh, okay, I'm being told to shut up. <laughs> but I had to take that opportunity to just share a little bit more about the campaign with you because I'm so excited. So um, un.org slash act now. Thank you so much. Uh, so we always want to make sure that we allow time for interactive discussion and so I now invite the uh, attendees uh, to please raise your hand to be uh, acknowledged and I will acknowledge you to speak. Uh, please uh, try to avoid common UN issues where the question asker speaks for five minutes. We'll try and keep comments to a brief period so our speakers can speak. Uh, yes, gen gentleman on the right here and then. Oh, okay, great. Oh, much better. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm a climate activist. I have worked in partnership. We have a campaign called 2020 or Bust. And the campaign is designed to bring the climate crisis into the hands of ordinary people so that they can actually see the specific actions to take in the specific time frame to end it. And we've worked with the authors of the UNEP Emissions Gap Report, many great colleagues at the UN. And the fact of the matter is, is that if 500 million people over the next two years take specific uh, carbon-reducing actions, we can actually get on track to ending the crisis. So we love working in partnership with you. We have an app called 2020 or Bust. It's the only app that actually puts the uh, power to end the climate crisis in ordinary people's hands. Uh, again, kind of in terms of what, like your pro, uh, program, you go in, log your actions. Everyone on the app is aggregated all around the world, but it's all inside of this next critical two-year time frame because I applaud all of the work that the UN is doing, but we've got to be aware that it is grossly insufficient to ending the crisis in time. So that's why this next two years is totally, totally critical. We are bringing this to the ordinary people. We've got a campaign called Don't Let the Planet Get Hotter Than You. We are making ending climate change sexy, attractive. We're going to get to the people that watch the Kardashians, the people that would never come to a conference like this, because that's who's going to make the difference. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. We definitely want to impact families. 2020 or bust, <laughs> download the app. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, yes, and the gentleman to your left. The organizers of the events today. Um, he, um, just to also thank all our presenters, you guys are wonderful. Uh, let us also inform the world that it's important that we also see how innovation technology can also fuel our passion, our skills, and our talents. Um, over the years, we've noticed that the communication language pushes people away. 
people want to see what can I bring as a, a cobbler? What can I bring as a, a high school student? I don't want to know the number of parts per million. How can I in real time be able to take part? How can I help uh, the ordinary people as, uh, as a farmer in Africa? And I think that the technology that we have today if we can fuse it to include passions in arts, in music, passions in dancing, in painting, it will do a lot of things. Um, three weeks ago, I designed an app that uh, helps uh, rural farmers in Africa be able to have a projection of what likely catastrophic events can take place. It's called a rep climb. It was launched in Sweden, and uh, the app helps... Um, uh, ordinary people trying to make sense of the environment now because we know that agriculture is core to the Africa or to most vulnerable community. But we also know that the environment has a lot of impact on it. If they have a heads up of what lies ahead for them, they will be able to make informed decisions. So I am so blessed to be uh, here. I want to thank Ms. Awa for giving me the opportunity to come here with my team from across the world. God bless you all. Great, thank you. Uh, I see, uh, actually, a, a student hand over here, so if you'll... Uh... <laughs> we need to decrease carbon emissions. Since over time, the population of the Earth is increasing, shouldn't we be uh, needing more carbon emissions to feed, to like grow more food for, for the um, population? Great, thank you. So the question is, with our growing population, uh, how can we expect to decrease carbon emissions uh, with that growing population as well as that should should be expected to continue to grow, correct? Yes. Okay. And maybe more food. Yeah. Do you want to? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Who would like to start? Tal? Okay. Fantastic question. Um, but I think when we look at climate, we have to look at it in a holistic sense, right? So addressing the climate challenge is a part of a whole. When it comes, my colleague here talked about the SDGs and how it is building blocks towards a better planet. So confronting the climate challenge means eating more sustainably. It means more uh, responsible production and consumption. So even though populations are rising, uh, there are opportunities where there is significant waste, um, there's significant pollution. We can look at those systems and address it. There, there are also areas where Poverty is what's leading to some of the carbon emissions that we're seeing as we address poverty, as we address uh, production. Those are uh, elements that can help us reduce our carbon emissions. No, 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 <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, so I would add to that that when we're thinking about carbon production and carbon emissions, that the goal doesn't have to be the complete eradication of carbon um, but that rather we're thinking about how can we be responsible stewards of the world that we are living on. And I think we want to avoid the thought of uh, what can often be talked about as a zero-sum game of we either have to have no carbon emissions at all uh, or why bother at all. And I think we need to find that better middle ground of responsible use of carbon and finding a way to uh, identify moderation and where we can avoid that waste that our speakers have spoken about and more efficient use of those resources that we have. Um. Kong, uh, I'm here today with a small group of my fellow countrymen. Uh, most of them are from mainland China. But the comment I'm going to make does not represent uh, their views. It's a purely personal one. In fact, it's a, a very quick comment on the use of plastic bag. Some of our extinguished uh, speakers touch upon on that uh, briefly, including the clean, uh, to clean or to re recycle those plastic bags. Uh, I remember many years ago, there were big efforts to ban or to avoid the use of plastic bags. Now we are in 2019. And we are still talking about to clean the plastic bag. Shouldn't we completely ban the use of plastic bag? Yes. yes. 
Thank you. You, you know, the reason that I, I propose this is every time when I saw my wife cleaning the plastic bag, I said, you are wasting the water. Water is, is also, we, 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 we should save as much water as possible, but of course, uh, it's better than dispose the plastic bag at one use. So nowadays, whenever possible, I will only use recycle uh, bag, not plastic bag. Thank you. Uh, we'll go up top and then I'll come over to you next. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, uh, so my comments are inspired by today's excellent presentations. I'm Scott Carlin from Long Island University, and I too seek holistic and healing solutions. I share today's passion for local and intergenerational action, and I encourage everyone to support the upcoming August DGC conference in Salt Lake City, where these conversations can continue. But I do want to comment, we have passed the moment of climate action. We have entered a dramatically new era. We live today in an era of climate emergency. The actions we take must not only reduce our impacts, but they must transform our way of life, especially in the industrial north. Most nations are not on track to meet the Climate Paris Agreement commitments. How do we accelerate those national efforts? How do we accelerate the efforts of our corporations and banks working in our own local communities? How do we use tools like the power of nonviolence to transform these structures in our world? Thank you. Uh, yes. Wait till it turns red, uh, the, the light. There you go. Okay. So my question is centered around rising economies and rising populations. Obviously, in Africa, that is becoming more and more industrialized, um, and the populations are going to rise. So how will the UN like, encourage the nations down there as they're developing to become more green? Will it be, like, I don't know, handouts, uh, money, or will there be... I don't know, what are the solutions being proposed right now? Great, thank you. Is that something new? We're going to hold to respond on that. We'll get a couple more questions, and then we will answer it as a collective. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, how would uh, all of you realistically convince people to completely change uh, like their way of living? Because I forgot who, but um, somebody said that uh, changing this wouldn't be easy and it'd be a big sacrifice. How would you convince the people who aren't willing to um, change their way to do so? Because it can be like really expensive and wouldn't really like suit them, you know? But yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, now, yes. Wait till it turns red. There. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I am Ada Metaliu from Albania. I am uh, part of an NGO, Team 54 Project is called. Uh, I just wanted to add something related to our economy. Uh, we learned that uh, economy in uh, general teaches us uh, how we can uh, select our, uh, the resources, the limited resources in our unlimited desires. But in, rea in reality, the problem is not that. The problem is that the economy nowadays is manipulating our ideas. We can survive even with limited resources. We don't want to have more food or more uh, 
different kind of products or clothes, etc., to be happy and to satisfy ourselves. Uh, this is uh, what I can say for nowadays. Thank you. Uh, yeah, straight ahead, and then we'll come over to you. I don't see where that. No, sorry, sir. The the lady up up front. I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thanks for being here today, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say, as we think of these rising economies and populations, as was stated earlier, um, I would like to consider a way that we can incorporate opportunities for otherwise marginalized groups of people into restructuring these sustainable production and assembly lines. Um, our work with Global Fund for Widows has incorporated widows into value chains. It's been incredibly powerful in um, empowering these women who have no other opportunities. So would like to just bring that to the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to bring up another topic. You guys were talking about plastics and advocating, but you didn't say anything about like CSOs or PCBs in the water that are also really affecting it. So I was wondering if you're going to advocate for those topics in any way. Thank you. Do I turn this off? <laughs> yeah, so we have to kind of sum up the questions, and then we're going to let the speakers just kind of start. We'll, we'll start with Tolu okay. and move on down the line. Uh, question about developing nations and industrialization and how we can think about the developing nations and how they can, uh, what attempts can be made to uh, develop in a green way, uh, how to convince people to make difficult choices about the environment, um, and then the CSO, PCP, and water uh, issue as well. So Tolu. Thank you. So <clears throat> those that are oftentimes at the, at the front line of the climate crises are not necessarily those that cause the climate crises. Mm -hmm. Those that are feeling its effects hardest are not the ones that are the biggest contributor to the problem. Um, and so as we ask people to make sacrifices and to make change, it's important that yes, we all do it together, but it's also important to make sure that those that were, are still at the front lines of creating this crisis um, have a lion's share of the responsibility when it comes to changing their habits and making those sacrifices. Um, and I think in the West, that is something that can be done and that is something that should be done. Uh, you look at the Global South, you come, when you think about our campaign and upcycling and buying um, and not buying new, and you look at individuals uh, in, in a lot of developing countries that are already doing that, right? Um, but not by choice. Um, you know, they're recreating, using what they have because what they have is all they have. Whereas here in the U.S., 40% of the clothes that we have in our closets, we never wear. Um, so I think there is an opportunity f there for us to be a leader on, on this issue um, and to take, to take our cues and to take our points from those that are already doing it right, even though they're suffering the, hard, they're suffering the effects of climate change the hardest. So uh, thank you so much for all of the fantastic questions. I think given the time, we can't answer all of them, but I'll do my best for what I can put forth. I think in terms of banning plastics, 600% um, for it. Um, as an individual, I think as an organization, we really look to try to create opportunities for individuals to come to understand the impacts that plastics have on their environment. And through that mindset shifting, hopefully that creates more pressure on a policy level. And to answer uh, Scott's question as well, maybe looking at how we can better collectively organize. I think a lot of times there's there's pockets of climate movements, whether it's frontline communities advocating and they message a certain way, and then there's different climate groups that come from like more of the private sector reform style, and how do we get everyone to really come together and communicate? And it's in finding those shared commonalities that I think we'll be able to find those final puzzle pieces that we need to push forward the momentum. Finally, I think to touch on just transition and equitable inclusion of vulnerable populations, I, I think 
with the uh, momentum that we're seeing with the renewable energy uh, field and space, we know transition is coming. Sustainability is the next forefront. It's our future. But how we transition isn't guaranteed. Is it going to be equitable and just and include people whose lives have been built on the um, the uh, fossil fuel industry? Are we including them in the transition to ensure that they aren't being left behind? If we do so, then I think we'll have a future that is bright and just. Um, and finally, just last thing would be individual action is great, but how can we as individuals, if we're already doing all that we can in terms of individual behavior change, how can we facilitate the behavior change of others? It's not by telling others to change, it's really shining that light on how beautiful these changes have been for us and leading by example and creating spaces for others to experience that as well. Thank you so much. So I only have 30 seconds, so, <laughs> so I'll make it very brief. I just want to touch upon uh, one thing about the rising population in certain areas. I think we have to look at, um, it's not, as uh, others have said, it's not so much uh, the population that is a problem, it's how we, our systems and how we produce. So when we look at uh, some, of, uh, some of those areas in Africa that don't have any infrastructure, it is actually the opportunity that when you are created a grid to provide electricity to a population that you do it in a clean way. Mm. So in that way, the population can increase, but still um, the energy that will be provided will be um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas overall. So I think we have to look into this and innovation as uh, other speakers have uh, talked about. And I just wanted to touch a little bit upon that idea of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we have to try to turn things around a little bit and not necessarily talk about it in a negative way. Um, we, had, uh, we had an event um, some time ago with a speaker who has banned waste in, um, in their family. Mm -hmm. And she's, they are basically living with just a few clothes that they can sort of repurpose. And they have found that the simplified life um, has brought us them so much joy and so much more opportunity. They are saying, we can travel anytime we pick our suitcase, put everything we have in our closet, and we are done. We can, uh, we can go. So um, we have to sometime, I think, look at the opportunities and not just the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Thank you. Thank you, um, I would just uh, emphasize the first word in our gathering here, families and climate action. I think in all these issues discussed today and issues raised, um, I think there needs to be family conversation and family experience around these issues. So it's through our families where we learn, where we first learn about values. Values about what's right, what's wrong, how to care for the environment, how to do the right thing. And also our attitudes towards food, how we shop, what we shop. Are we, are we involving our kids in making the shopping lesson? Family business. Small farms, family runs small farms. I mean, so think about these issues in family engagement in all of these domains, including family opportunities for getting involved in nature, like those family nature clubs, and family engagement in political action. I think that really needs to be important as well. So I think family could be woven into many of these issues to address your question earlier how do we get people to change? I think we need to really pay a lot of attention to family. Thank you. So thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, I want to, of course, thank the organizers for this event, uh, the terrific Renata Kazmarska, uh, focal point at the UN uh, for families. Uh, she is terrific and a joy to work with and is a great force for families. And then I also want to invite Awa Diallo uh, from the Civil Society Department of Global Communications to provide our final ending to this great event. Thank you all for your attendance. but I'm seeing the heads are shaking um, with the videos. Uh, but I really wanted to thank everybody for coming out today, for really having this really fantastic conversation. I really do apologize on behalf of the department and the unit uh, for the technical difficulties. This auspicious meeting place that we find ourselves in 
the United Nations has a lot of firewalls. <laughs> so sometimes and very frequently technology fails us, fails us, but I think what we really do value is this kind of face-to-face -face interaction that we've had today. I think all the questions and all the back and forth with the audience I think is really what makes the United Nations, and I want to say what makes my team very unique and uh, really very uh, ideal, so thank you. Um, what I can say is that um, we will um, upload all the videos um, on the website of um, uh, the Civil Society Unit uh, so that everybody can take a look at it from there and act now. <laughs> Thanks again to the panel for really um, you know, talking, I think, to the audience. That's what we value on this platform, to really speaking with people and getting that fantastic feedback. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in DESA. It's a pleasure working with you, and uh, we hope to continue sharing that uh, word um, about the UN work globally. I want to thank you in the audience. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> and I know I'm going to see you in Salt Lake City, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so much, everybody.